Welcome to another episode of The Empire's New Clothes. I'm your host, Brad from MacArthur. We're speaking with Lawrence Wilkerson today. He's a retired colonel from the U.S. military. He volunteered for Vietnam, and amazingly, he witnessed a war crime in the process and set his helicopter down in between the perpetrator and the village. He went on to become the chief of staff of the Secretary of State of Colin Powell during the Bush administration. He was actually tasked with writing that famous speech of Colin Powell saying to Congress that there's weapons of mass destruction in Iraq. Following that, he actually came out as a whistleblower, notifying some of the shadiness behind that whole process. He since left government, and he now teaches at William Mary University on government and policy and has some amazing seminars on empire. In this conversation, we dissect what is the American empire and where might we be heading. He's a great person to have these conversations with. It was very illuminating, and I hope you enjoy them too. Welcome, Lawrence. Looking forward to chatting. Surely. So I know you used to be an Army Ranger, you're a veteran of Vietnam, and also the Chief of Staff of Colin Powell, but would you mind explaining a little bit about your uh, background with teaching? Uh, Lawrence Wilkerson, I'm a professor of government and public policy at the nation's oldest university, public university, College of William & Mary. I say public because Harvard's older. Harvard's private, of course. I spent 31 years in the United States Army, um, and I spent four plus years as a diplomat at the State Department, first as a member of Ambassador Richard Haas's policy planning staff, and then as Colin Powell, the Secretary of State's Chief of Staff. Um, Since then, I have been teaching at the George Washington University, and as I said, College of Women Mary, and other universities where I occasionally lecture, like Penn State, Cal Berkeley, and so forth. Um, for about 16 years. This might be the whole conversation, I don't know, but U.S. polarization, in your perspective, how did we get here as, as where we are today? What forces brought us to today? Well, it's been a long road, um, and it's been a complex road. And if you're a historian of sorts, or any way at all, or you're just a citizen who knows a bit about American history, Um, And I say that because there aren't too many Americans anymore that know anything about American history. That's part of our problem. Uh, There's an incredible ignorance out there about our own history. Um, But if you remember or you can recall the period between 1850, um, what I call the beginning of the Civil War, and the actual years of the Civil War from 61 to 65, and then probably even more indicative of where we are today, though the intensity of those former years is indicative too, the passion of those years, and the utter incapability to deal with that passion. Um, Even more vivid in political terms, which is what I study, um, is the period after the Civil War, from the impeachment of Andrew Johnson up until the end of Reconstruction, which really is a deal by the North and the South to put blacks back into slave chains again. There's just no manacles. It's economic slave chains. Um, And those those years are years of what we're seeing now. Incredible passion on both sides. There are actually more than two sides, but certainly both sides that we like to think about today that are characterized in large part by, but illly and not aptly, the two political parties, the Democrats and the Republicans. Uh, One of the things that Americans don't realize is that the leadership of both parties are pretty much in the same camp, the camp of empire, the camp of predatory capitalism, the camp of, as Mark Fisher has said, an economic system that if we don't change it is going to take us right over the cliff and maybe the entire globe with it. Um, So studying those periods will tell you that we've been here before. This is not the first time that this republic, such as it is in its 200 plus year history, has arrived at a point like this, a point of major crisis, existential crisis. The last time we did, of course, we killed all the, almost a million of us in a nation that was near, not nearly as big as now, maybe 40 million. We mounted a million man army that was bigger, more powerful and more battle hardened than any other army in the world. Indeed, European powers who had sent observers to its battlefields from 1861 to 1865 
um, quaked in their boots as to what Grant and Lincoln and then Johnson might do with that army overseas were it to take a mind to. Fortunately for the rest of the globe, it didn't, and we disassembled that army fairly rapidly. Um, so if you look at that period, you understand us. You understand the hatreds. And I'm talking about slavery and racism. I'm talking about they never died. They're still with us. In my region of the country, they are still there. And they have migrated. They've migrated into Pennsylvania. They've migrated into Ohio. They've migrated out to Idaho. There are people in this country who are stark, raving racists. And unfortunately, today, many of them constitute a considerable portion of our current president's base, political base. There are others who, from that period, and people like John C. Calhoun and others, um, see the division of the country as being antithetical to their purpose, their purpose mainly being power and wealth. And so have as much, but it's a much more complex and educated and sophisticated opposition to the rest of us, if you will, as any of these slaveholders did in 1850. Um, so we have this incredible division in this country, not only political, but social and cultural. And many political scientists, I'm not sure how I come down on this argument yet, but Many will tell you that if you have what is a supposed democracy, representative republic democracy, federal or otherwise, and you have a rough 50-50 breakdown in terms of people willing to take up guns and go fight for their views, you don't have a democracy anymore. What you have is a revolution ready to happen, and you're in trouble. You can't govern it. You can't make laws. You can't get people to abide by those laws. Indeed, uh, you have several possible uh, outcomes, one of which is tyranny. Um, and I would say today that we are looking at, we are looking into the face of what Alexander, uh, Alexander Hamilton, James Madison, and others wrote about when they said the surest route to tyranny is through the war power. And you're looking at a country that has been at war for almost 20 years. No end is in sight. And it's extremely profitable for a lot of a lot of the oligarchs in that country. Um, people like the CEO of Lockheed Martin, the largest merchant of death in the world. Uh, people like the CEO of Exxon Mobil, who sells more fossil fuels to the Department of Defense than any other entity in the world. Uh, DOD, if it were a country, if it were a country, would rank with Portugal on the list of fossil fuel consumers. So. DOD is a huge, huge profit well for these companies. Um, and we're caught in that today. And, and I would say that one of the reasons we can't seem to govern ourselves is just that, that there is not the possibility of compromise. There's not the possibility of building enough people on one side or the other of a position to make the kind of laws, to do the kind of things that need to be done not least of which is refurbishment of our infrastructure, which grows older and older and more decrepit every day, uh, to combating what's coming down the road at us, the climate crisis. We can't seem to get our act together. The latest version of that is the corona uh, coronavirus uh, pandemic. We can't seem to rule ourselves in the midst of this really uh, to be expected it's been predicted for a long time. Indeed, in my military, it's been wargamed and simulated for a long time. We can't seem to handle it. Do we even understand this existential crisis? As in, you and I and many others can see the hallmarks and the, the signs, and, and we, we know it's here. But do we as a nation collectively understand we're in an existential crisis? Or do many folks, are we just going about our lives as were and getting just slightly more enraged about a other group of people on the other side from us? That's a good question. My students ask that kind of question all the time. And I think uh, calling on their answers and, and my own uh, opinion on this, I would say there's a number of contributors to what would be a fairly complex answer. One is the apathy in the country. Um, I've, I've been in all 50 states in the last decade. I've been on college campuses from Iowa State to California, Berkeley to you name it virtually. 
Um, and people just don't get it from a point of view of they don't want to get it. They would rather go on with their lives. They would rather put their face in their cell phone. They would rather, you know, get on their computer, do whatever, make money, uh, survive, do whatever is necessary, depending on their class. <laughs> and it is a country of classes now. Um, and so apathy is a huge part of it. Indifference, apathy. Another huge part of it is ignorance. Well, I just referred to that earlier. I've never encountered a group of young people, for example, but I don't discount the older ones, too, who, for example, can't even tell you what century our Civil War occurred in or can't even tell you that World War I came before World War II. <laughs> I mean, it's just basic stuff like that, not to mention the civic virtue that is supposed to be inculcated through whatever system we come up with. They thought in the, oh, say the early 18 to the end of the end of the 1800s that it was going to be some form of public education. And I think it's fair to say throughout the 20th century, we thought that was working. And to a large extent, the first half of the century, at least, it seems to have worked. But civic virtue was the greatest concern of people like Adams and Jefferson when when they those two reconcile, for example, after their many years of fighting amongst themselves and disagreeing with one another. Their greatest concern, if you look at their letters, their greatest concern was the lack of civic virtue in the country. They wanted to form a national university in order to teach this, because I think it's fair to say that both of them thought the experiment would be over pretty shortly because when they were gone and men liked them. And if you want to say Abigail Adams and others, women liked them, but it was mostly a male world at that time in terms of power. Um, when they were gone, it was going to be over pretty shortly. I think they'd be surprised that it lasted as long as it did. Um, but that's part of the problem, too. And another part of the problem is not so much ignorance as it is because there's some very intelligent people out there, but they don't know how to scope this. They don't know how to, to actually assess the nature of the problem and then come up with some courses of action on how to fix it. Or if they do, they resign themselves to the belief, and there's every reason to hold this kind of belief in some respects, that it's not fixable, that there's nothing they can do about it. And so increasingly they grasp the straws that are available. They live in their uh, 9,000 square foot home, or they go to the university, they send their kids to university and so forth and so on. And they think everything is okay, salvageable at least for the moment. And yet in their minds, they have this uh, pre-conscious or subconscious even realization that things aren't really very well and that things are getting worse. Um, and, and that's difficult to deal with because it's hard to get them energized and get them pointed in a single direction. I think one of the examples of this was Occupy Wall Street. I watched that very closely. Um, I, of course, went through as a veteran of Vietnam and, and as a combat soldier in Vietnam, I went through the wrenching period of the 60s and 70s, early 70s, the peace movement, as it were, which was motivated essentially by conscription by a genuine angst about war and people not wanting to kill people and by some really idealistic convictions and other purposes, less, uh, less salubrious. And, um, so I, I, I pondered why there wasn't one when we were at war for so much longer as we have been now. And it's, it's fairly simple to answer that question. There is no draft. So less than 1% of 330 million people are bleeding and dying for the others. And they're perfectly happy with that. As long as they can say thank you for your service occasionally, they're per perfectly happy with that. And two, there is no sense of danger in, in the real sense of an enemy on the shoreline. And so there's no motivation to be involved in that. And it just goes on and on and on and allows these oligarchs to make huge amounts of money off these wars and therefore gives less and less incentive for the Congress taking money from these oligarchs uh, to do anything about it. So it's a combination of a lot of these things, uh, ignorance, apathy, greed, uh, buying into the predatory capitalist system, uh, indifference, 
and um, an elitism that doesn't know what to do with itself. Back to Occupy Wall Street, why didn't leadership show up? Why was there no leadership for that movement? And the argument amongst some of them that they didn't need leaders because it was a grassroots mo movement is nonsense. You always need leadership, whether you're Lenin and Trotsky and you're bringing about the Bolshevik Revolution <laughs> or, or you're George Washington and Sam Adams and a bunch of others bringing about the American Revolution. Um, you need leadership. You have to have leadership. There's no leadership in this country. There is no leadership. Right now, in my profession for 31 years, the military, I can't find you a single general or admiral who has a brain. They are all brain dead. They have no imagination. They have no creativity. They have no desire to change the status quo because as happened last year, 65 to 70% of them are going to walk out of their military uniform and into a six or a seven figure job with one of the defense contractors whom they've supported while they were in uniform. So there is no leadership at all in arguably the most powerful element of our society and in some ways the most strategic thinking element of our society. It's simply maintain the status quo. If we got 750 billion from the American taxpayer this year, we'll get 760 billion next year. So those are some of the problems with getting out of this. Is this just a playing out of the same story that's happened throughout history of a of a group of people have an idea, an empire, and it grows and it's vibrant, it's healthy, and then there's just this malaise and just comfort and things just kind of settle and the, the parts of human nature that we all deal with as people just begin forming and coming to the surface and, and we just traject off in this alternate direct, like you look at the Roman Empire and how they just, it was almost the downfall of success in a way. There are many facets to it, but that's certainly one of them. And uh, I, I want to say quickly that, uh, you know, I think it was Marx that said history repeats itself only in the sense that first it's tragedy and then it's farce. Uh, we, we, we might be a farce compared to the Roman Empire, but we're certainly not a farce compared to power. I think we are probably, in terms of real power, that is what Athens talked about when it was running the Peloponnesian League, power to kill people, power to change whole states, whole nations, whole countries. Um, we are awesome globally. We can, you know, we could bomb Iran tomorrow morning with carrier task force planes and planes out of al in Qatar, for example, and the Iranians would wake up three weeks or four weeks later and their lives would be majorly altered. And a lot of them would be dead. It would be to no end other than the fact that we can do it. As the Athenian general said to the millions when they asked him, why are you gonna kill every man, woman and child? Because we can. Or as Thucydides intimated, um, the powerful do what they want and the powerless have it done to them. Um, we are that way, as Rome was that way, and we are decaying in that respect much the way Rome did. We are also decaying in certain ways much the way Britain did over a very long period of time. At one point, the sun didn't set on the British Empire, and then 70, 80 years later, the sun set over London, and that was about it. Uh, and even those that clung, like Canada and Australia and so forth, clung only to the ceremony. Um, Jeremy Greenstock once said to me uh, when I was doing an interview with him that they were a middling power now. And I said, oh, Jeremy, the United Kingdom, a middling power? And he said, damn straight, I'm just telling you the truth. It's a middling power. Well, he's right. They are a middling power. They can barely feel their military now. Very professional, very competent military, but they can barely feel it because people just don't want to serve. Uh, that's part of the problem in this country too. Um, one side of me says, I wish everybody would say they wouldn't serve, and then we might have some sort of chance for peace in the world. Uh, but that's, that's kind of uh, Panglossian. It, it, it's even utopian, because as long as there's dangers out there, and there still are dangers, uh, then you gotta have something, particularly if you possess as much power and wealth as we do. But that's, that's a good description of it. it the, the demise of empire has characteristics. 
And those characteristics are there with Rome and they're there with Britain and they're there with almost every empire that's ever existed. Now you have some unique ones like the Third Reich, which barely lasted a decade. And that wasn't much of an empire because it was an empire of pure military power and some really decadent evil. <laughs> so different empires go away different ways. But uh, the one my students and I study the most, I think it's fair to say, is not just Rome. We do look at Rome a lot, but mostly Britain, because Britain looks a lot like us. After all, we came from there. Mm -hmm. um, and the other aspect of it is, as my students want to point out from time to time, but Britain had another country to expect to replace it with whom it could forge a relationship. And that's, of course, us. And you look around and you say, who in the world today, what state might we do that with? And people say, well, China. Hmm, <laughs> I'm not sure that's what we want. <laughs> not with Xi Jinping running the whole thing mm -hmm. or, or, or any Chinese leader I can envision in the near future. Uh, so there's not a backup <clears throat> for us. There's not some place where we can find an off ramp, slide down onto a side road, get off the freeway of empire and say, okay, it's your turn now. You take over and you have the pain and the agony for a couple hundred years. Yeah. You're going to take a break. Can't do that. And so that's an inhibition, if you will, to people in the interagency group in our own government, for example, like me, who would like to fashion an off-ramp because they see the train wreck coming. And there are not many of them, but there are some. And there are some in some fairly high places who think that way. Um, so... Comparisons are good. They help you gain insights about your own straits, your own predicament. But I think ours is unique in many respects. And the most important respect might be there's no one to turn it over to. Hmm. So most would argue, I think, most scholars who study this sort of thing would argue that what you'd be turning it over to is a Hobbesian world, a world where we might have uh, famine and chaos, disease, pandemics, uh, lack of any kind of government that was meaningful, certainly no global government and no real international law for a century or more. We'd return to a sort of semi-dark ages. I don't want this to be super doomsday, but there's real implications of what we're talking about. And so let's take it there for a moment of with one hand on history, as you say, but another hand firmly on today and reality of what's happening with us right now. Where do you see this heading in say, to put some numbers on it, the next decade, the next two decades, if we're traveling down a road, what are the signs that we must hit before we hit others? Because we're not just going to suddenly be a broken empire tomorrow. There's things that must happen along this process. And so what are some of those hallmarks of this road that we, in a sense, must travel down? Yeah, it's like we're 330 million lemmings headed for a cliff, and there's a few signs along the way that <laughs> say, cliff ahead, 100 meters, <laughs> and slow down. <laughs> um, it, it's hard to say. Um, we had a real contentious seminar. I like those kind of seminars for provocations of plenty, because that's where you learn. Uh, recently, where we, we essentially talked about three possible futures. One was dismemberment. And most people look at you and say, are you talking about the United States falling apart? Yes, that's exactly what I'm talking about. Why would California with 40 million people and the fifth or sixth largest economy in the world want to stay with this beast called the United States? When Wyoming sits right next to it with 400,000 people and both have, in terms of the most prestigious governmental body in the country, the Senate, the same representation. That doesn't make any sense. OK, so 40 million Californians might want to go somewhere. I don't want to talk about Texas. I've actually had conversations with Texas legislatures about how, quote, we could leave anytime we wanted to. We've done it before, unquote. <laughs> and states like New York. Why would New York and California, who provide about a third between them of the entire GDP of this country, and keep Mississippi, Alabama, and other southern states alive, literally keep them alive because their additions to the GDP are minuscule and it's only revenue sharing 
and transfers of wealth that even keep them going, they would be Botswana's if it weren't for New York and California. Why, why would they want to continue to do that? So the idea that we couldn't fall apart is preposterous. All one need do is look at the history of states since the Treaty of Westphalia in 1648 to know that that is a very possible outcome. We could fall apart. A second outcome is that we just physically destroy ourselves. Physically. That is F-I-S-C-A-L-L-Y. I'll give you an indication of how that is a potential. The Congressional Budget Office recently published a report. I think it's fairly substantially correct that says in another 10 to 15 years, the interest payments on our debt, which is now going up astronomically with this response to the coronavirus, and the defense budget together, roughly a trillion each, will cancel out all other discretionary federal spending. We won't have any money. <laughs> we'll be broke. Um, you can say, well, you know, you can that aggregate debt, even if it's 30 trillion, which the CBO says it will be in just 10 or 12 years, even if it's that big, you, you yeah, debt doesn't matter like that. You can be like John Maynard Keynes and you can say, in the long run, we're all dead. That's not very comforting, you know, if you think about it, but that's what he said. Okay, you can run deficits forever. Dick Cheney said it a different way. He said Ronald Reagan proved deficits don't matter. That's not very comforting either. But you've got to make those annual interest payments on your debt. You have to or you default. And default would be economic crisis of major proportions. Um, so what are we going to do? That future alone, that physical uh, impropriety, uh, physical uh, lackadaisical attitude towards it, whatever, modern monetary theory, which now says you can print all the money you want as long as you have printing presses and you can just get along with it. That's crazy. That's insane. We're watching the incipient movement to replace the dollar in the world right now. We don't know whether it'll be a microcurrency, a Bitcoin type apparatus or another currency like the, uh, the, the renminbi from China or the, the um, uh, euro or whatever. But I, I happen to think myself that it's going to be some very unique new form of exchange that we'll come up with. And this thing we're on right now, the Internet, will probably be a large part of that. Uh, that said, if you take the dollar away from its reserve status and its uh, transaction status in the world, you just cut our power overnight by about 50 percent. Charles de Gaulle once said the most pernicious weapon America had was the dollar, power of the dollar. Uh, that's when we forced the uh, British and the French out of Suez by threatening a run on the pound in the IMF. That was Eisenhower's major t tool at that time. So if you become physically profligate, like we are approaching the point of no return in today, then that's another way to go. And how do you pick up the pieces of that afterwards? Because the coronavirus will pale in comparison in the damage done to our economy when that happens. It'll be a long time before we pick up those pieces. That could lead to dismemberment. You could take a, a state like California, you take a look at that and say, basket case, all the rest of these people, we're out of here. We're going to revive our economy. We're going to get it going again, and we're going to be prosperous again. And it'd be a lot easier for that tight 40 million out there on the West Coast than it would for 330 million, 100 million of whom are holding everybody else back. So that could lead to dismemberment. And then the other thing we talked about was the more positive, optimistic outcome where we find an off ramp. We figure out how to stop these stupid, endless wars. We figure out how to control the oligarchy that leads us into these wars. We figure out how to get off of fossil fuels and onto a more robust, resilient future energy source or sources, more likely. And we figure out a way to deal with all the politics involved with that at the same time we're making the decisions to do it. Um, I'll give you three guesses as to which one didn't get a vote for it'll probably happen <laughs> amongst my students. That's another thing. Uh, despite all my praise of them, and I would give you endless praise of them, their intellect, their energy, their dynamism, and so forth, they are really not happy about what we're leaving them. Not happy at all. I don't blame them a bit. Um, the other day, some young ladies were having a party across from my townhome, 
and they had a sign out there. They're probably 24, 25 years old, just entering, entering the workforce, having just left university. And they had a sign out there that said, baby boomers will pay. I told my wife, I told my wife, I said, look at that sign. They're saying we're going to die in order to save them. <laughs> I said, well, that's what they should be saying in every respect, because we've really screwed the place up. Not just my generation, but generations around mine, too. Um, since 1945, really, we have really squandered enormous power to do good, to do well, to do positive things in the world, many of which we did enlightened self-interest, if you will. But nonetheless, we did them. We resurrected Europe. We resurrected Japan and so forth. We provided public security for those countries for a long time. But in the last few years, since 9-11 in particular, we have begun to, at an enormously rapid rate, squander our power and not do it the way we should be doing it, the way we tried to do it for the first few years. Um, and they know that. And they know that the reason they're going to leave school with a home mortgage on their back and the reason that they have all this physical problem facing them is us and our profligate ways with their money. We just had tons of monetary stimulus um, and crazy fiscal stimulus like the kind we haven't seen for a long time, helicopter money and everything. This is leading us more down your second option, it, it appears. Can you touch on more of the technical aspects of how you see massive quantitative easing affecting our economy as a whole, and then possibly how the big injection of fiscal stimulus is affecting us as well? When we've had our seminars on essentially the economic demise, the financial demise, um, I've had students in my seminar who were economics majors, either macro or, my, or micro, um, and in some cases both. And looking at it from their perspective, and I think they've convinced me, there are a number of ways that this kind of demise, this kind of end of empire, which is, I might add, traditional. If you look at any empire that's gone away, it usually has been, at least in part, because of its uh, uh, inability to manage the treasury. Um, one person, uh, I forget who it was, but one historian actually described the British exchequer as being available to everyone and therefore no one. <laughs> and that, that's essentially uh, what you do with things like we just did uh, or things like my administration did when we handed out all the money after the housing crisis um, and we essentially bailed out the, the bigger banks. Um, if you if you devalue that which is most important to your economic strength over time, you are automatically going to negate that e economic strength. Now, what do I mean about that? If you go back and you look at the gross domestic product of this country, which uh, let me hasten to add, I don't think that's a really great measurement anymore of economic power. But in 1945, it was a pretty good gross measurement. And what it said was the United States at the end of World War II had 51 to 52 percent of the global GDP. Now, that's astounding if you think about it for a moment. We could make 50,000 airplanes in a single year and did. We probably left more armaments outside Tokyo to form reefs for fishes and so forth after World War II than we made in the last year of the war because there was so much. It was incredible. We had a 7,000 ship Navy in the Army. We had a 10,000 ship Navy in the Navy. We now are lucky if we can put 300 ships at sea. So it was just an awesome time, and our gross domestic product reflected that. We manufactured. We made lots of things that subsequently, and during that time, the world wanted to buy. Everything from refrigerators to automobiles and so forth. You look at our GDP today, and the only thing in there that excites you is the high-tech stuff. It's the stuff that everybody wants. It's the hardware and the software. Um, but if you look at the rest of it, it really, really begins to concern you. It's healthcare for people over 60. It's cosmetics 
Um, Thirty billion dollars, I think, the last time I looked in cosmetics. What do cosmetics do for anybody? Um, when you look at that GDP, it's really a soft GDP. And you consider the fact that it's so inaccurately constructed anyway today, you say that's no real measurement. So what do you look at? You look at the infrastructure. You look at the future of that infrastructure. I mean, water. I mean, uh, transportation systems. I mean, the kinds of things that you would say if you were coming in, let's just hypothesize for a moment and say, okay, I'm going to buy America. What is your infrastructure worth? Well, you'll hear people say $50 trillion. You'll hear people say more than that. Bullshit. <laughs> I wouldn't buy that. It, it stinks. I mean, it's going to fall apart. It is falling apart. So just how much is America worth today? And GDP doesn't reflect that. You have to really get out in the hustings. And you have to start looking at things. You have to start looking at highways, looking at waterworks, looking at the future. Is this going to be here in the future? This house over here, this 9,000 square foot home that was just built for $7.8 million, is it going to be here in 10 years? It's going to cost $2 million to fix it in 10 years because it's so shoddily built. And the, and the material in it is so shoddy and so forth. That is how you measure the intrinsic value of the country today. And when you measure it that way, it doesn't look too good. So I think that's what concerns me most of all, is the very foundation of whatever superstructure we put in place is falling apart. So it doesn't matter if it's a liberal, neoliberal or a Chicago version or whatever. It does matter because those things are failing, too. But it doesn't it doesn't really matter what you got on top for the superstructure. That is how you conduct your economy, free markets, whatever, if everything underneath is falling apart because you've got no foundation for it. I think that's the real problem. But the superstructure is important, too. I, I, do, I do think that Mark Fisher's right when he says, he calls it capitalist realism. I call it predatory capitalism. And in essence, for me, very simplistically said, predatory capitalism is capitalism with no powerful labor movement to check it and no powerful regulatory system from a government to oversee it, regularly enforced and powerfully enforced. Um, people will say, well, no, that you're, you're looking back at FDR and Francis Perkins in the past and all that. I'm not necessarily talking about the same kind of uh, regulatory system or the same kind of labor movement. I'm just saying you need something to counter the capitalism, both official in the federal structure and more or less grassroots from those who are being exploited by that system in order to keep that system in check. We've lost both. And so that system is just out of control right now, totally out of control. When you have a pharmaceutical company that can be found guilty and fined $2 billion for having sent Risperdal out to children, injured or kill some of those children, done absolutely nothing for them. It was a placebo at best and a killer at worst. And they do like this after the court renders its verdict and say cost of doing business and going right back to do it again with another drug, you're in trouble. And we're not just talking about big pharmacy. We're talking about all, almost all the things we could label big, big oil, big uh, aviation and transportation, you name it in this country, that are falling apart that way in terms of delivering a meaningful product to the consumer, to the buying public, and to the globe. So you know, it's not just that Boeing sends airplanes out there that don't seem to fly where, very well anymore. Interestingly, that only started happening when Defense Department people began to become the leadership at Boeing and bring the kind of shoddy products that Boeing makes for DOD into its civilian production too, you've got real problems. And we have enormous problems in this regard, in our economic foundation, in our philosophy, and our approach to building the superstructure, which people call neoliberal economics, whatever you want to call it. It isn't working. It simply isn't working. You talked about this at the opening of the interview. Uh, we have the greatest maldistribution of wealth in this country today that we've probably ever had, certainly as bad as 1929, right before the big crash. And we're not doing anything about it. We're just deepening it and making it more profound. And as long as we have this economic foundation and we have the current economic uh, financial superstructure, 
we're going to just make it worse and worse. We're going to undermine it day after day after day until it just collapses on us. This latest stimulus, if you will, <laughs> this latest package is sheer smoke and mirrors. It, it's, it's sh go print some more money. Go turn the presses on and print some more money. We have printed so much money, I don't even think the brightest, smartest economist in the world today actually knows what's going to happen. The, the amount of uncertainty that we are building into the global system and into our own system because of that is unprecedented. And as most economists will tell you who are worth the salt, the most fragile part of economic thought, of, of financial sobriety, of financial soundness, is just that, uncertainty. You don't ever know when the people are suddenly going to say, I'm, I'm out of here. I'm through with that. I'm not doing that anymore. Um, you, you see a little bit of that with the impact on the markets of the coronavirus. Uh, I don't know how much of that is being orchestrated. And that's another concern I have today. Um, it's it's kind of like CEOs buying their own stock and driving up the price. That's a microcosm of the macrocosm, which is just general cheating, uh, uh, bending the system for the benefit of those at the top. And then the question becomes, as one student said to me, well, where do those at the top go when it all comes crashing down? Because they'll come crashing down with it. And I said, study history a little bit, and you'll see that the Rothschilds and others of the world always find a place to go, like rats deserting a sinking ship. Yeah, and some of them, when they desert, drown, but lots of them find new places to, you know, continue to make their riches. Will they go off this planet to do that? One of my students said. And I said, no question in my mind that some of these billionaires are working on rockets and things like that because that is their expectation of the future. You know, are they going to go to Mars? Where are they going to go? Are they going to live under the ocean or whatever? I don't know. But I do know there is a nascent movement out there amongst some of these incredibly wealthy people to figure out a way that if we do destroy this planet, they don't have to go with that destruction. What is this a story of? Is it a story of the trajectory of humanity through our outworkings of economics and society? Is this a moral issue? Is this just the roller coaster of fear and greed through the markets? Is it just one big experimentation, as you said, in this new world of economics we're in? Or, or is this just a classic cycle of humanity through the ages of exuberance and, and then a return to fear and uncertainty? I think the unique aspect of it with regard to what you just said, which is a, was a good outline summary of the possibilities, <laughs> classification possibilities, the unique aspect of it is the climate crisis. I think for the first time, we have an empire with hegemonic power that can be felt any place on the globe, Rome, any place in the Mediterranean, North Africa, um, but now the globe, um, where not only is that imperial writ threatened, and is it being shattered every day by tribes in Iraq, tribes in Syria, tribes in Afghanistan, um, but it also is facing the prospect, along with all of its uh, subordinates out there, of planetary destruction. Or at least, I don't think planetary destruction, my own personal view is the right way to look at it. The planet is gonna shake us all. One of my friends at American University writes poetry. He's a Ibn Khaldun professor for Islamic studies, wrote The Thistle and the Drone, Akbar Ahmed. And Akbar wrote a poem the other day, and at the end of the poem, he's walking amongst the petals falling from the cherry trees, and he's watching the birds and everything, and he's commenting in the last lines that the birds and the cherry trees will probably still be here, and maybe even flourish, because we're gone. So the planet is not going to destroy itself, probably, but it might shake us off, or it might shake so many of us off that we re-enter a period of dark ages as we try to climb back out of it. I'm talking about five or six billion people dead overnight virtually. The crisis that is coming on us with sea rise, with desertification, acidification of the oceans, and so forth and so on, could grow to the proportions that we've done simulations. And the group I work with works with NASA computer models, NOAA computer models, 
that's the National uh, Oceans and Atmospheric Administration and the National uh, Science uh, or, or National Space Administration. They those models are very very good, and the very uh, dismaying thing about them is every time we come up with new variables, like right now we're feeding variables in from Antarctica because Antarctica we know now. We haven't really codified it yet, but it's melting a whole lot faster than we thought. Mm -hmm. um, when you put these new variables in, the computer models run, and they don't run to our credit thereafter. They run to our discredit. That is to say it's happening faster. So we're looking at potentially an existential moment for the human race, and we're looking at the demise of the leading political and financial and economic power on the face of the earth, the United States of America, or the serious de deterioration of its leadership and its capacity to lead at the same time. This is bad. <laughs> this is really bad for the human race. So there's your incentive for fixing this, in my view. There's your incentive for getting the leadership back, for bringing the right kind of initiative to all of these problems that merge together will at least ameliorate the situation somewhat where the majority of us manage to survive on this planet and we began to turn the situation around so that the planet is hospitable to human life and every other form of life that we can salvage too. Um, that means a lot less population probably. It means that we go back to some kind of economic system that probably doesn't have as its purpose growth. Imagine that. And, but <laughs> imagine, back up and imagine, how could you possibly sit there? And remember Adam Smith? wrote more about moral theory than he did economic theory. So your question about is this a moral issue, you bet it's a moral issue. It, when you look at the, the fact that we've been operating on this principle of, okay, by 2050, let's have another 3 million people on the globe, 3 billion people on the globe, and let's bring 2 billion of them into the middle class. As one of my Indian friends said, Indian as from Delhi, said recently, where are we going to get nine more planets? Because that's what we're talking about. So you got to have a new economic theory, a new economic foundation. It's got to look as much at preservation of human life and the quality of human life as it does its profit. That's going to be difficult, but it's got to be done. Let's leave it at that. I really appreciate all of these thoughts. It's been amazing. Make sure to keep away from those um, angry Gen Zers across the street over there. <laughs> <laughs> I've already talked to them. Okay. <laughs> what name is you? Right, <laughs> yeah. because I'm your neighbor. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and you like my flowers. <laughs> yeah, maybe make them some cake or some cookies now and again. You know? yeah. They're constantly coming over here and clipping my flowers and taking them back and putting oh, them in their basement. Oh, awesome. <laughs> Enjoy the rest of your day. I really appreciate your time. You too. And stay safe up there in the northern country. Here at The Empire's New Clothes, we believe something big is in America's future, but we don't quite know what. If you'd like to continue the journey with us, like, subscribe, and let us know who you want us to interview next in the comments below. This next decade is going to be crazy, so join us as we try to figure out what's going on, and I look forward to seeing you next week.